Uh, I'm just going to uh, introduce our next speaker now, who's uh, Associate Professor Paul Stewart. Now, uh, Paul is, uh, teaches and conducts research at Sydney Medical School and Sydney University, uh, as well as working in private practice. Uh, he's part of the Quality Review Committee at the Adventist Healthcare and uh, on the Limited Health uh, Human uh, Research Ethics Committee. He has a lot of research uh, interests and has presented a lot, particularly on neuromuscular functioning and on uh, uh, neuromuscular pharmacology. And he's also published uh, in a number of international uh, journals. He's received a number of awards from ANSCAR and the ASA, including the Smith's ASA Award and the Gilbert Troop Prize. He's also been uh, he's an, uh, a good chap and, and does things around the world, and he's uh, provided anaesthetic relief services in the Cook Islands and Solomon Islands, uh, something that I think is uh, great to be able to do, as well as having a number of other interests. So today, Paul is going to uh, speak to us on neuromuscular monitoring, and please welcome him to the stage. Thank you. So uh, thank you for that kind introduction. It's great to see you here, so many here early in the morning. Um, today I'm talking about uh, neuromuscular function monitoring, time and reversal agents, boromine rings and Brunian links. Uh, I, come, I work, do most of my private work at the Sydney Adventist Hospital, at, uh, which is a private hospital associated with um, the te teaching of medical students from Sydney University. I've got the following disclosures to make. Receive research grants, equipment loans, and honor area from a number of different companies and organizations. So just first of all, just think to yourself, who uses neuromuscular function monitoring whenever they use non-depolarizing neuromuscular blocking agents? Do you use quantitative or objective monitors? And how do you decide when to extubate your patients? And again, how often would you see residual blockade in, your, in the recovery unit? Not your patients, but your colleagues. So what are boromine rings? In mathematics, boromine rings consist of three circles which are linked to form a Brunian link. And by removing any ring, this results in three unlinked rings. No two of the three rings are linked to each other. None, nonetheless, all are linked. We cannot consider neuromuscular function monitoring if we don't consider which reversal agents we're using and also the time required for that to have its effect. The South American Indians were the first to use muscle relaxants, Wallari, to hunt animals. And it wasn't until 1942 that Harold, Harold Griffith and Enid Johnson published in Anesthesiology a case series of 25 uh, patients in which intercostrin and extract of curare was used to facilitate surgical operations. They concluded that this was a potentially dangerous poison and it should only be used by experienced anesthesiologists in well-equipped operating rooms. Today, we define residual neuromuscular blockade as a trainer for ratio of less than 0.9 using mechanomography or electromography at the adductor pollicis muscle. This year, ANSCA has re new, uh, released new guidelines on neuromuscular function monitoring. They state, neuromuscular function monitoring, preferably quantitative, should be used whenever the anaesthetist is considering extubation following the use of a non-depolarizing muscle relaxant. The Association of Anaesthetists of Great Britain and Ireland also have guidelines. Uh, they are a little different in, in the fact that they say that um, neuromuscular function monitoring is essential for all stages of anaesthesia where neuromuscular blockade, blocking drugs are administered and this is best monitored using an objective quantitative peripheral nerve stimulator. 
So just briefly, I'll go through uh, why we should monitor neuromuscular function, how we should do it, what stimulus patterns, how to assess the responses, what muscles to monitor, when to monitor, and which patients to monitor. All these slides are available to um, the attendees at this conference, and they're all referenced uh, if you'd like to um, go to the original articles. Uh, also, I've got a number of hidden slides that actually reference some of the top uh, subjects that I've talked about, so they're all there for you to use. So why should we monitor neuromuscular blockade? First of all, you can see these two graphs. The graph on the, on the, right, on the left hand side shows the effects of a small dose of rock uranium, 0.1 milligram per kilogram. On the vertical axis, we have the twitch height and the horizontal axis, um, the baseline to peak effect. And you can see in some individuals, this dose of rock uranium will have absolutely no effect, where in others, we'll see a reduction of twitch height to 20% of the control. Again, if we look at our graph on the right-hand side, this is a larger dose of rock uranium, a milligram per kilogram, and this time our uh, vertical axis is the recovery time in minutes, and the horizontal uh, axis is the time from its peak effect to a trainer for ratio of 0.8. And again, we can see almost a 300% difference, somewhere between 30 minutes to recover for the fastest patients, and then others will take 90 minutes to recover from uh, the peak effect of the blockade. This uh, work has been um, validated by a number of different studies. Here is a study by DeBain in which they studied over 600 patients, and these patients were given an initial intubating dose of atricurium, vecuronium, or rocuronium, and you can see um, this line here is the uh, trainer for ratio of 0.7, the higher one is 0.9, and you can see that some patients have taken uh, over two hours to recover. If you look at the analysis of this data in a little bit more detail, what it shows is that th after a single intubating dose of any of those relaxants, 37% of patients will still not have reached uh, a trainer for ratio of greater than 0.9. Many of us would consider if it's been two hours since an initial dose, we don't, are uh, not required to administer any reversal agent. So what are the complications, what are the problems with patients with residual neuromusc blockade? Again, um, this is just a, a few of the many articles in the literature, but basically they come from volunteer studies, database studies and the clinical studies. In the volunteer studies, um, these volunteers are infused with low doses of muscle relaxant. And what do we see? We see upper airway obstruction, pharyngeal dysfunction, increased gastric aspiration, impaired hypoxic ventilatory drive, and the unpleasant feelings of muscle weakness. The database studies show an association with major morbidity and mortality, and the clinical studies show adverse respiratory effects, delayed discharge from recovery, and post-operative pulmonary complications. If that's not enough uh, reason to monitor neuromuscular function, uh, if we monitor induction, we can optimize intubating conditions during maintenance, optimize surgical conditions, um, assessment prior to reversal uh, to select the reversal agent and the dosage, and also to confirm adequacy of the reversal. How prevalent is residual neuromuscular blockade? Again, if we look over the years, it's going to be around about 30 to 40 percent. Even the latest, uh, one of the latest studies by Bruckerman uh, showed that patients reversed with their usual practice with neostigmin had a 43 percent incidence of residual neuromuscular blockade. Um, this is um, the impact of uh, one of the studies we uh, published last year in anaesthesia and analgesia 
And this is a multivariate logistic regression analysis um, uh, for model for residual neuromuscular blockade. And not surprisingly, um, as you probably all know, we found the older the patient, the more likely you are to have residual uh, neuromuscular blockade. Abdominal, patients having abdominal surgery are more likely to have residual blockade. And also, if the surgery is less than 90 minutes, those patients are at risk of residual neuromuscular blockade. In our univariate analysis, we also uh, found an association with neostigmine use and residual blockade, but this was not uh, borne out in the multivariate uh, analysis. So how many people um, throughout the world use objective monitoring? Again, most anaesthetists in Europe, Australia and New Zealand do not use quantitative neuromuscular function monitoring. In the latest edition of uh, Miller's textbook of anaesthesia, they state objective neuromuscular monitoring is essential for the management of neuromuscular blockade intraoperatively and at, at and its reversal for postoperative care. So that's similar to our, our new guidelines. However, most anaesthetists are flying blind. So how should we monitor neuromuscular blockade? Many anaesthetists use clinical signs. We have the subjective monitoring with the peripheral nerve stimulator, and then we have the quantitative objective monitors. With the clinical tests for residual paralysis, many of these require an awake, a cooperative, a co cooperative and in some cases, an extubated patient. None of these tests can reliably exclude residual blockade. Again, this uh, analysis by Camus showed that any of uh, the clinical tests that people use are not sensitive, but if you happen to find any of your patients in the recovery ward with any of these, um, these signs, think of residual neuromuscular blockade. The reason um, the patients are able to perform some of the tests is that um, but the, they're still at risk uh, from the side effects of residual blockade is that the pharyngeal muscles are the most sensitive of all the muscles to neuromuscular blocking agents. So we may have diaphragmatic breathing, movement, but we will still have paralysis or weakness of the pharyngeal muscles. And you can see here the adductor pollicis or first dorsal interosseus that we monitor are somewhere in the middle. What stimulus patterns should we use? These can be applied with a simple nerve stimulator or the quantitative monitor. But commonly, um, we use just the trainer four ratio and the post tetanic count. If we have just a peripheral ob uh, subjective uh, monitor, the double verse stimulation is a little bit more sensitive uh, for detecting fade than the trainer four ratio. When we're using neuromuscular function monitoring, just remember that none of um, these monitors will show any effect until 75% of our receptors are blocked. With the trainer four count and the post tetanic count, we're able to define the various depths of neuromuscular blockade. Intense blockade is defined as no response to the post tetanic count, and of course, no response to a trainer four uh, stimulation. Deep blockade is a post tetanic count of greater than or equal to one, uh, and of course, no trainer four count. And moderate or shallow blockade is defined as a train of four count of one to three. So how to assess evoked responses? If we're using uh, a subjective monitor, uh, we can only use visual or tactile techniques, and we cannot detect fade, an experienced anaesthetist cannot detect fade um, if the train of four ratio is greater than 0.3 or 4. So if they've got residual blockade somewhere between 0.4 
and 0.9, we won't be able to detect fade and we won't know whether those patients have even recovered fully or still got residual blockade. What we can do is we can actually uh, help um, use, or use the peripheral nerve stimulator to uh, select the reversal agent and the timing, but we cannot confirm adequate reversal of blockade. If we've got a quantitative monitor, uh, we're able to uh, objectively assess the evoked response. And this can be divided into two groups. Uh, the comp uh, electromography, which measures the compound evoked muscle action potential, or those monitors which assess the contractile or mechanical response. And in clinical practice, we were able to use kinemography and accelerography. And some of these um, monitors we can actually display quantitatively on uh, the screen with the rest of our uh, parameters. So here, the vertical lines are the train of four ratio, and here is the, the train of four uh, response recovered here to uh, over 60%. So kinemography uh, is a piezoelectric strip that's placed between the thumb and the second finger and there's a change in the voltage and record the response, uh, responses recorded uh, with a number. It actually shows uh, excellent precision. It will overestimate mechanomography or EMG at the adductor pollicis by about 10%. So therefore we should aim for a trainer for ratio of at least one to exclude residual neuromuscular blockade. Um, electromography can be used in any muscle, of course, but um, if we look at the muscles that are innervated by the ulnar nerve, um, the adductor digiti minimi, the ADM, gives very um, repeatable and very precise uh, responses, and I use that almost routinely for, for my monitoring. Um, when we're setting up electromography, um, before the administration of the muscle relaxant, we would um, calibrate uh, the machine. This is a typical biphasic wave of the compound evoked muscle action potential, and we would assess the supramaximal stimulus before administering the muscle relaxant. Some of the advantages of EMG is it doesn't require a mobilisation of the entire arm. It's not restricted to a specific, uh, specific muscle. You can perform it in any hand position. It's easy to adapt in clinical contexts, less complicated than MMG and a good correlation with MMG. The third type of uh, quantitative monitor is the accelomography. Um, and again, um, for all types of neuromuscular function monitoring, this is emphasized here, we should maintain the temperature of the uh, hand of greater than 32 degrees uh, Celsius. With accelomography, there are actually many different types of AMG monitors. They've got different algorithms, and the TOFWATCH SX or the STIMPOD um, often give a baseline reading of greater than um, one. So, in fact, before administering a muscle relaxant, you may see readings of up to 100 or 150, 190%. Um, so those are the values that you're aiming for to exclude residual neuromuscular blockade. If you apply these monitors after the administration of a, a blocking agent, you won't know what you're aiming for to exclude blockade. Also, um, if anyone was at our neuromuscular function workshop yesterday, we were doing um, kinemography, it's the same with the accelomography in awake patients. You, there may be some resistance and therefore even patients without, uh, not under the influence of neuromuscular blocking agents, may show trainer four ratios of 0.7 or 0.8. So what muscles should we monitor? Well, that depends uh, again on what we're looking for. Um, if we want to exclude uh, all diaphragmatic movement, well, then we should uh, monitor the diaphragm. If we're aiming for full recovery of the pharyngeal muscles, 
it's the pharyngeal muscles. But if we aim for a trainer fall ratio of greater than 0.9 at the uh, first dorsal interosseous of the adductor pollicis, we can exclude residual blockade. Um, commonly we use the ulnar nerve. Um, we can also use the facial nerve. Um, but the facial nerve is more like the diaphragm and it's more resistant uh, and will recover earlier than the adductor pollicis and it can lead to overdosing uh, with muscle relaxants. Also with the facial nerve, you're more likely to get direct muscle stimulation. Uh, the posterior tibial has also been used in the response of the flexor hallucis brevis uh, observed and that can be similar to um, the adductor pollicis, but there are not a lot of studies out on that. So when should we monitor neuromuscular blockade? Induction, intubation, maintenance of blockade, the assessment prior to reversal, and the assessment of the adequacy of reversal. Again, uh, my technique is I, I give the, induction, the anaesthetic induction agent, having set up the equipment previously, and we establish the supramaximal stimulus, perform the calibration, and if we're using EMG, confirm that typical biphasic uh, waveform. Then because of that variability uh, on the on duration of onset and the effect of the, the blocking agents, we like to ensure um, that we've got removal of um, the tra all train of four counts before intubation. What are the problems um, with intubating before the relaxants had time to effect, uh, take effect? Again, there are a number of publications that look at the incidence of um, laryngeal trauma, hematomas, edema, or a hoarse voice. Also, um, we reduce the number of difficult intubations we experience if we wait for the muscle relaxant to come on adequately. I monitor during the maintenance of blockade, again, to give uh, good operating conditions where it's absolutely critical that there's no movement. We could be talking about uh, eye surgery, neurosurgery, and there are also laparoscopic surgery. Conditions have been shown to be improved in some meta-analysis with deep blockade. This is um, one of my, my cases. Um, the vertical lines in this situation are the post tetanic counts, so we've maintained deep blockade throughout the procedure. Uh, this is one of the meta-analysis showing, meta showing that deep blockade um, improves uh, conditions in laparoscopic surgery. Now assessment prior to reversal. Assessment prior to reversal, have we got deep blockade, these post tetanic counts, have we got moderate blockade with a, a train of four count of two, or has the patient already recovered? So if we've got a peripheral nerve stimulator, we're able to uh, identify uh, whether we're able to reverse the patient or not if we're using neostigmin. So if we've got a train of four count of um, two or less, don't even try and reverse with uh, neostigmin. And on the other uh, side of the coin, if we've got a train of four, uh, a count of four, without fade, we don't know whether those patients have recovered or not, so we can use a smaller dose of neostigmin, 20 micrograms per kilogram, without the risks of um, adverse effects. If we've got um, blockade induced with rock uranium, we can reverse all depths of neuromuscular blockade whether it's shallow, moderate, deep, or intense. The dose is important though, two, four, or 16 milligrams per kilogram. If we're using quantitative monitoring, we're able to identify these patients that do not require any reversal agent at all. So how long does it take to reverse a patient with moderate or shallow blockade? If we have, um, reversal of two milligrams per kilogram of Sugamidex, we can see the average is 1.4 minutes, and the outlier in this case has taken five minutes. If we're reversing moderate blockade with neostigmin, we find the average is around 18 minutes, 
but the outliers could be an hour and a half. So if you're not using quantitative monitor, monitoring, we don't know which patients are going to take that time to, rec re to recover. Again, with deep blockade, a similar thing, don't even try and reverse deep blockade with neostigmin. If we've got intense blockade, if we've used a rapid sequence induction with rock uranium, 1.2 milligrams per kilogram, and we compare that with the reversal times uh, spontaneously with succimethonium, we can see the recovery to a T1 of 90% with the succimethonium is 10.9 minutes, whereas if we wait three minutes after rock uranium, give um, Sugematex 16 milligrams per kilogram, we've got a recovery to T1 of 90% at six minutes. Also remember that the type of anaesthetic agent we use affects the reversal time. If we have propofol anaesthesia, the average reversal time of shallow blockade with neostigmin is seven and a half minutes, whereas if we're using an inhalation agent such as sevoflurane, it's, uh, the average is 22 minutes. If we reverse with Sugamidex, it's independent on the type of anaesthetic agent, inhalation or intravenous, average is 1.8 minutes. And this effect um, of the inhalation agents is most um, notable with desflurane. So assessment um, of neuromuscular blockade uh, to confirm recovery, we can only do this with quantitative monitoring. So we don't want to administer neostigmin inappropriately if a, a patient has already recovered. This may in fact cause uh, paradoxical muscle weakness and Miller had stated if given when neuromuscular function is completely recovered, paradoxical muscle weakness theoretically may be induced. So we were interested in this because of one of our early, earlier studies wanting to know whether neostigmin caused a uh, depolarizing or a non-depolarizing block. So we took uh, 21 uh, healthy volunteers, randomized them into received saline or one uh, dose of neostigmin 2.5 uh, with 450 micrograms of glycopyrrolate and repeated that at uh, 15 minutes if they tolerated. Um, this is uh, part of our experimental setup. We looked at things like hand grip, spirometry and also the clinical signs. Just very briefly, um, we saw that even after doses as low as 2 point, uh, 30 micrograms per kilogram of uh, neostigmin with glycopyrrolate caused a 15% reduction of FEV1 and those uh, tolerating a second dose we saw a reduction of up to 24%. Similarly with um, a percent reduction of FEC, 27% um, at 15 minutes. And we also noted that the uh, FEV1, FEC ratio was unchanged. So this is um, restrictive ventilatory uh, impairment that is seen uh, characteristically in respiratory muscle weakness. With the hand grip strength, again, with uh, even 2.5 milligrams of uh, neostigmin, um, we saw a 20% reduction in hand grip strength and with the second dose, reduction up to 40%. Symptoms and signs, as we'd expect, um, we'd see uh, dysphagia in all of the patients, weakness, um, but also the glycopyrrolate didn't remove the uh, abdominal uh, cramping pain and um, nausea. So this is just, uh, I'm not sure if this is going to work, this is just, uh, I might have had to, have to um, press. Um, okay, so this is one of our volunteers that re received 30 micrograms per kilogram of neostigmin. You'll see the fasciculations of the tongue and the eyelids. When we looked at the, um, the Tra train of four responses, there was no, no fade in the train of four ratio and we had a depression in twitch height so that confirmed it was a, as you'd expect, a depolarizing neuromuscular blockade. So um, in the absence of neuromuscular blockade, 
doses of neostigmin as low as 30, milligrams per kilo, 30 micrograms per kilogram caused um, muscle weakness. So who should we monitor? Everybody. Monitoring does make a difference. And uh, if we use monitoring and Sugamidex, this paper by Bruckerman um, demonstrated, we can get a, a zero incidence of residual blockade. So I had 15 common mistakes that you can get. Um, uh, you make monitoring neuromuscular function, but you can look at those on the slides. We've run out of time. Uh, but I just wanted to emphasize that the reversal agent, the monitoring and the time are irreversibly linked. If we have no reversal agent, um, we know that at two hours, 37% of our patients will still have a trainer for ratio of less than 0.9. We can only identify these with quantitative monitoring. If we're using uh, neostigmin, uh, neostigmin is dose dependent and dependent on the depth of blockade. We can't reverse deep blockade. And remember, even to reverse shallow blockade, it might take up to an hour and a half, two hours. So we must have quantitative monitoring to determine which of those patients. If we've got Sagamidex, uh, we could in fact use a subjective monitor um, to reverse shallow blockade induced by rock uranium, because if we waited five minutes, we'd know that they would be reversed. So will you continue to fly blind in the OR? Thank you very much. Thank you.